The Adventures of Mark Twain, Part 2. My friend Ben Tapa, who was 19 years old, 6 feet high, 3 feet wide, and some distance through, and just out of the infant school, was made orderly sergeant. He had a hard time. When he was mounted and on the march, he used to go to sleep, and his horse would reach around and bite him on the leg. And then he would wake up and cry and curse and want to go home. He was town-bred and did not seem to have any correct idea of military discipline. If I commanded him to shut up, he would say, Who was your slave last year? One evening, I ordered him to ride out about three miles on picket duty to the beginning of a prairie. He said, What? In the night? And them blamed Union soldiers likely to be prowling around there any time? So he wouldn't go. And the next morning, I ordered him again. He said, in the rain? He didn't go. Next day, I ordered him on picket duty once more. This time, he looked hurt. He said, what? On Sunday? You must be a darn fool. Well, picketing might have been a very good thing, but I saw it was impracticable, so I dropped it from my military system. We had a good enough time camping out there in the fields and woods until one day we heard that the invader was approaching, so we had to pack up and move, of course, and within 24 hours he was coming again. So we moved again. Next day they were after us once more. Well, we didn't like it much, but we moved rather than make trouble. I later found out it was U.S. Grant and his men who was chasing, around like, chasing us around like that a man I would come to know quite well under much different circumstances some decades later. Anyway, this went on for a week or ten days more, and we saw considerable scenery. Then Ben Tupper lost patience. He said, War ain't what it's cracked up to be. I'm going home if I can't ever get a chance to sit down a minute. Why do these people keep us a humping around so? Blame their skins, do they think this is an excursion? Some of the other town boys got to grumbling. They complained that there was an insufficiency of umbrellas. So I sent around to the farmers and borrowed what I could. Then they complained that the worship she toss was out. There was mutiny and dissatisfaction all around. And, of course, here come the enemy pestering us again. As much as two hours before breakfast, too, when nobody wanted to turn out, of course. This was a little too much. The whole command felt insulted. I detached one of my aides and sent him to the brigadier and asked him to assign us a district where there wasn't so much bother going on. The history of our campaign was laid before him, but instead of being touched by it, what did he do? He sent back an indignant message and said, You had a dozen chances inside of two weeks to capture the enemy, and he is still at large. Well, we knew that. Feeling bad? Stay where you are this time, or I will court-martial and hang the whole lot of you. Well, I submitted this brutal message to my battalion and asked their advice. The orderly sergeant said, If Tom Harris wants the enemy, let him come and get him. I ain't got any use for my sharing. Who's Tom Harris, anyway, I'd like to know, that's putting on so many frills? Why, I knew him when he wasn't nothing but a darn telegraph operator. Gentlemen, you can do as you choose, but as for me, I've had enough of this sashing around so you can't get a chance to pray because the time's all required for cussing. So off goes my war paint, you hear me. The whole regiment said with one voice, that's the talk for me. So there and then on the spot, my brigade disbanded itself and tramped off home with me at the tail of it. I hung up my own sword and returned to the arts of peace. And there were some people who said I hadn't been absent from them yet. We were the first men that went into the Confederate Army in Missouri. We were the first that went out of it, anywhere. The philosophers among those here seven might reflect on the fact that it was only after I discharged myself from my military obligations that the Confederacy fell. General Grant, who was not one given to paying compliments gratuitously, Later said frankly that if I had conducted the whole war, much bloodshed would have been spared. My brother Orion, ten years older than me, the oldest of my siblings, had gone against the grain of most people in our part of Missouri and 
advocated abolition and unionism. In fact, he had tirelessly campaigned for Abraham Lincoln when that man was running for president. After Lincoln was elected to that office, my brother was rewarded for his efforts by his being appointed Secretary of the Nevada Territory, a brand new territory which Lincoln wanted to become a state soon, a desire that would be fulfilled just three years later in 1864. Orion had no money to get to his new situation in Nevada. I wanted to get away from the war, and I had money, saved for my wages as a pilot. So I bought the tickets for both of us, and we headed west together, first on a steamboat up the Missouri River to St. Joseph, Missouri, and the rest of the way by stagecoach from St. Joseph to Carson City. It took us 20 days to make that journey on the stage. Today, it would only take a few days by train. During that long, bumpy ride, we saw Indians, desperados, jackrabbits, coyotes, lots of sagebrush and dust, and even the occasional Pony Express rider. We finally arrived in Carson City, the capital of the territory, travel-worn and covered with alkali dust. The first person we met when we got off the stage in Carson City was a man who went by the name of Jack Harris. Passing by on horseback, he stopped to welcome us to the city. He barely got past saying hello when he begged leave to interrupt himself, saying, I'll have to get you to excuse me for a minute. Yonder is that witness that swore I helped to rob the California coach. A piece of impertinent intermittent, sir, for I'm not even acquainted with the man. I did notice that he didn't deny the charge, just took offense at the man being a busybody. Well, these two became acquainted immediately thereafter, because Jack rode over to the stranger and began to rebuke the man with his six-shooter, and the stranger began to explain his point of view with another. The exchange of opposing viewpoints was brief. The impertinent meddler resumed repairing the hitching post he had been working on, and Harris rode away, nodding politely to Orion and me, with a bullet through one of his lungs and several more in his hips. That was our introduction to Carson City. And a pretty fitting one, too, for things like that happened there pretty often back then. Much of the time until statehood, Orion functioned as acting governor of Nevada, as Governor Nye was frequently out of the area, either in San Francisco or Frisco, as we called it, or back east somewhere. In fact, my brother could have continued in high office in Nevada after statehood, except for one thing. Of all times, he chose then to become a staunch prohibitionist, something the hard-drinking voters of Nevada were decidedly not in favor of. Orion's political career ended with a resounding thud. He never held public office again. There was something I noticed about Carson City that really struck me. Everybody rode horseback in that town. I never saw such magnificent horsemanship as that displayed in Carson streets every day. And I did envy them, not being much of a horseman myself. But I did learn to tell a horse from a cow and was burning with impatience to learn more. I was determined to have a horse and ride myself. Plus, this thought was in my mind, the auctioneer came through the plaza on a black beast that was something like a dromedary and fearfully homely. He was going at $22 for horse, saddle, and bridle. A man standing near me, whom I didn't know, but who turned out to be the auctioneer's brother, noticed a wistful look in my eye and observed that that was a remarkable horse to be going at such a price, let alone a saddle and bridle. I said I had half a notion to bid. Now, he says... I know that horse. I know him well. You're a stranger, I take it. You might think he is an American horse, but he is not anything of the kind. He is a Mexican plug. That, that's what he is. A genuine Mexican plug. There was something about that man's way of saying it that made me just determine that I would own a genuine Mexican plug if it took every cent I had. And I said, has he any other advantages? He hooked his forefinger in the pocket of my shirt and led me to one side, and in a low tone so that no one else could hear, said, Shh, don't say a word. That horse can outbook any horse in America. He can outbook any horse in the world. Just then, the auctioneer came back around. Twenty-four dollars for the horse, saddle, and bridle. I said, Twenty-seven. Sold. 
I took the genuine Mexican plug, paid for him, put him in a liver stable, let him get something to eat and get rested. And then in the afternoon, I brought him out into the plaza. Some of the citizens held him by the head and others held him down to the earth by the tail and together let his back sag down. I got on and then the plug arched his back up suddenly and shot me 180 yards. And I came down again, straight down and lighted in the saddle and went up again. And when I came down that time, I lit on his neck and seized him and slid back into the saddle and held on. Then he raised himself straight up in the air on his hind feet and just walked around a while like a member of Congress. And then he came down and went up the other way and walked around on his hands just as a schoolboy would. Then he came down on all fours again with the same old process of shooting me up in the air. And the third time I went up, I heard a man say, Oh, don't he buck! So that's what bucking was. I was very glad to know it. Not that I was enjoying it, but that I had been taking a general sort of interest in it and had naturally desired to know what the name of it was. And whilst I was up that time, somebody hit the horse a whack with a strap, and when I came down again, the genuine bucker was gone. While this performance was going on, a sympathizing crowd had gathered round, and one of them remarked to me, Stranger? You have been taken in. That's a genuine Mexican plug. And another one says, Think of it. You might have bought an American horse. You stole all kinds of work for just a few more dollars. Well, I didn't want to talk. I didn't have anything to say. I was so jolted up, so internally, externally, and eternally mixed up, gone all to pieces. I put one hand on my forehead and the other one on my stomach and if I had been the owner of 16 hands, I could have found a place for every one of them. Being in Nevada, where the great silver deposits, such as the Comstock Lode, were located, it was only natural that i catch the fever to strike it rich. I had expected to just be able to go out into the hills outside of Carson City and find silver lying on the ground, where I would gather it up, get rich, and go home and stop. But it was not that way. I eventually got to know substantially everything there was to know about mining except how to make money at it. In time, I abandoned mining and went to milling. That is to say, I went to work as a common laborer in a quartz mill at $10 a week and board. I only lasted a week there because when I asked for an increase in wages to $400,000 a month, I was invited to leave the premises. Then something else turned up. I had written a few letters for the press, and just when I was about as broke as I could be, I received a letter from the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise offering me $25 a week to go and be a reporter on that paper. I could hardly believe it. That was a lot more than I had been paid at the stamp mill. If I had been offered the job of translating Josephus from the original Hebrew, I would have taken it. So I walked 120 miles from the mining camp of Aurora on the California border and pretty quick time took the berth. When I arrived in Virginia City, I noticed what a rip-roaring town it was. I saw that there were fire companies, brass bands, banks, hotels, theaters, gambling palaces, parades, street fights, a dozen breweries, half a dozen jails in full operation, and some talk of building a church. When I walked into the newspaper office, my new co-workers had no idea who I was. They'd never seen me before. They didn't know if they were looking at a miner, a gunslinger, or a landlocked sailor. I was wearing the typical western costume, a blue woolen shirt, denim pants, slouch hat, and a navy revolver stuffed into my belt. I also had a red beard hanging halfway down my chest and was carrying a bunch of blankets slung over my shoulder. I tramped into the newspaper office, collapsed into the first chair I came to, and after a while, with everyone there staring at me, I said, Dang my buttons if I don't believe I'm lousy. My starboard leg seems to be unshipped. I like about a hundred yards of line. And that's how I got my start as a writer. I eventually moved to San Francisco and worked on several papers there. Then had to escape that city for a while and went up into the hills of the gold rush country, where I heard the story that I turned into the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County which led to nationwide fame and to those first lectures which I gave in San Francisco, back in Carson City and Virginia City, and even towns such as Red Dog, as I mentioned earlier. 
Thank you. You've been a great audience.